me chapter 8. As you consider the work of God's people as they're traveling, what was their biggest obstacle? Well, of course, we could do that on a spiritual level and say their biggest obstacle was faith, trusting in God to give them deliverance. And we're going to see some of that in Deuteronomy chapter 7. But really, as you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 8, you recognize that the question would be, do they trust in God? Because if they trust in God, they would have this victory over this major problem that they had, and that was all the nations that were in the land before them. And you think about what God has done, and you think about the Israelites who have lived, they experienced, in many cases, God parting the Red Sea, God striking down the firstborn throughout the entire land of Egypt, darkening the world, turning the water to blood, plague after plague, miracle after miracle. These people had seen God's power. And by the way, Israel wasn't the only one who had seen God's power. The nations around, Egypt was feeling God's power. The surrounding nations were noticing. And then you come into Exodus 16 and 17 and Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, and God has warning after warning, and the people have failing after failing because they simply forgot. They seem to forget what God had done. And so I, I realized this morning that if you consider how fast we forget things, it's not really that surprising. If I were to ask everyone a no-no question here, I'm going to say, who made a New Year's resolution? Statistics say that by this point in March, less than 10% of Americans are keeping the resolution. Y'all, that was two months ago. <laughs> okay? The Israelites have moved through, again, depending on which part of the Old Testament, they've been in the wilderness, wandering around, a new generation had arisen. Maybe they were the folks who had been there and been at Mount Sinai at the base, which, by the way, what did they do when Moses was gone? Well, we couldn't see Moses, couldn't see God, even though we had all the scary lightning and thunder going on in the mountain. And so we're going to make our own golden calf. They forgot. I don't think many of us forgot that a year ago this weekend, the way we viewed everyday life changed. And I think we're going to remember that forever. I've, I've said that my grandmother growing up, I lived in a house where my mom took care of my grandparents at a certain age, and we just had all kinds of drawers of stuff. I don't know what else to call it. It was just stuff. But one thing in particular that she had was a drawer. I don't mean a bag. I don't mean a portion. I mean a drawer of twist ties. Now, I don't know what your twist tying where you need a whole drawer, but we had them. And if you needed to borrow them, we had them. I guess we'd take them back. I don't know how you keep that many. But you realize what happened is she grew up in the Great Depression. And in her part of West Virginia, that country was hit real hard. That the country area that she surrounded in needed everything that they had. And she learned to save everything. And she was incredibly thrifty in that way. And so forever, 80 years later, there are twist ties in a drawer in Orlando, Florida. We could go to Walmart and buy as many twist ties as are in there for probably like $8. But we had those twist ties from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Why? Because she remembered this life-altering moment. And I wonder what we're going to be stocked up on. I have some guesses. CB tells me not to mention all the toilet paper that went off the, the rack in March. But whether it's Clorox wipes or some sort of hand sanitizer, we, this generation, is probably going to be stocked on supplies for a really long time because now we've been exposed to something new, a government shutdown. Regardless of your feelings on that, that was paradigm-altering. We had never been told when we could leave our house or what we could go to for many of us in this country. And yet here we were. And isn't it fascinating that just a year later, and our freedom relative to what it was last March and April is leaps and bounds more open. And we're kind of forgetting. We talk about how terrible it is right now, how limited we are right now. Do you remember last March and April? What we can do, we can step outside. We can go get something to eat. Regardless of your feeling on these policies, isn't that a completely different world? And it's just one year later. I think when we read Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're going to see it's important to remember God. And while it's important to learn life lessons while we're living here that help us in a day-to-day, -day, it's more important to remember what God has done because it shapes how we trust Him. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 1, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that He might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Continue down to verse 11. Take care lest you 
forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today last, when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you, to do you good in the end. On the precipice of victory, on the precipice of finally, after years, after generations of slavery in Egypt, the people are about to inherit the promised land. And what are they called time and again to do? To remember, to make sure they don't forget. If you think about how God guided Israel, it's very important to see the order in which he did it. They were to remember that God had provided everything. This is amazing about God, and this is lost all the time in our conversations with other people who are struggling with ideas of faith and how we teach our children. All all these issues come back to one idea. Faith is important, and we walk by faith, not by sight, but God has always, 100% of the time, given us something to be faithful in first. We don't just kind of stagger around and say, all right, I just got to believe in something. That's not true. And with the Israelites, what did God do over and again? He did all the mighty, wondrous things, and he did it first so that they would look to him and that they would trust in him. Isn't that exactly what we just read in verse 11, beginning? What did he say in verse 12? When you have eaten, when you're in your good houses, I don't want you to forget. I don't want you to get puffed up by what? Well, we've made it. We've arrived. We're doing good. Well, why were they doing well? Well, because what did God do? Verse 14, God took them out of Egypt. Verse 15, God led them through the great and terrifying wilderness. God, and boy, does this have my opinion here, with its fiery serpents and scorpions, God took care of them. He took care of them with scary snakes. They needed to remember God led and took care of every need they had. That's important. Why? It's not important just to get through. That's true. It's not important just because we're about to battle all those giants in the promised land that the spies saw and were terrified of. It's important because when I am good, there is a temptation to forget how I got there. And now we see all of a sudden us. I see me in this chapter. I see Americans in this chapter so well because we are doing well. What is a life-changing event to us was still this past year would have been the greatest year on record for most of world's history and most of the living world. As upset as we were, as limited as our freedoms were, last year, when you consider the whole picture of American society, was near the top of the world's history in terms of its material blessings. Isn't that pretty amazing? And yet, what do we see and fixate on? Well, we fixate on the negative. The hard part. And that's understandable. When we face trials, we face that. But again, what did God do when they were thirsty in verse 15? He provided them water from the rock. When they were hungry in verse 16, he provided manna from heaven. They needed to remember that God got them where they were going. And so what would he do? He would motivate them with this information. Notice in chapter 7, in verse 17, very important. It's not just to say, hey, don't forget, don't be arrogant. That's true. But sometimes we look at the world and we do see those tough problems and we do say, hey, I don't know if I can get past this. And so it's the opposite of arrogance. It's this kind of humility that's so strong that we discount ourselves. And again, if we remember God, once again, here's a solution. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter seven in verse 17. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. How? What what is God's answer to fear? But you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. What is the solution again? To remember, to trust that God will take care of you. Verse 23, the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. So you see in the first point that God will take us through these tough times, and we need to remember that so that we're not proud, we're not arrogant, we're not boastful. But on the other spectrum, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we need to remember God to remember that we can do great things if we allow God 
to use us. You see, it's both sides. Remembering what God has done on the record motivates us to be better and to trust in him and to be thankful and to be humble. And the problem is not that God failed at showing any of these miracles, not that God didn't provide for them. That The Bible record is clear. God absolutely took care of every one of their needs. He reminded them to not forget. They had all kinds of feasts to remember. They had all kinds of people who lived and saw the miracles. And notice with me three quick illustrations in Exodus 16. Three separate times. By the way, there's a lot to choose from. I'm trying to go with the most direct and well-known. In Exodus chapter 16, here the people are hungry. Now, that's a relatable feeling. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse 2, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, keep in mind, we've been hungry, but most of us have not been hungry in the way that these people were. They had nothing to eat. And by the way, this fond memory they have of Egypt, remember God said, talked about that. He said, remember, I took you out of land of Egypt, out of what? Out of slavery. But they remember, oh, how good it was in Egypt in verse 3. Would that we have just died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. They forgot all that God had done to free them from Egypt, all that God had done. By the way, that parting of the Red Sea, that would be something I think I would remember. But in Exodus chapter 17, maybe I wouldn't. Chapter 17, now the people are thirsty. In verse 1, all the congregation, the people of Israel, moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Again, they forgot. And by the way, one of these stories in 16 or 17 had to happen first. So they not only forgot what happened in Egypt, they forgot God literally taking care of the other half of the basic needs of food and water. God has done this over and over. It's not a one-time thing. God didn't do one miracle of all time, and we look back to it. By the way, we need to be careful not to do that in our life. The creation is powerful. In Romans chapter 1, we should know God and his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature from the things that have been seen. But that's not the only time God's done miracles. That's not the only time God's done something miraculous in our lifetimes. And the people should have remembered that, but they didn't. And in Numbers chapter 14, one final passage, and then we're going to draw some application this morning. In Numbers chapter 14, Number chapter 14, one final passage of illustrating this idea that the people forgot, no matter how many times God would have them remember. In verse 1 of Numbers 14, then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt. Quick note here, if you've ever considered leadership, are you enjoying what Moses and Aaron are facing all the time? The whole congregation is grumbling. The whole congregation is whining, complaining. Whether their, their gripes are reasonable or not, what is the answer? And it's not just have more faith. It's look back to what God has done for you. This isn't a mystery. This isn't something that should, they should have said, well, we, we think God can do it. The question is, is he on our side? That was never in question. God had promised, I want you to have this land. In fact, go spy it out. I want you to see how good it is. And what did Joshua and Caleb come back and say? This is a great land. In fact, this is a great land that we can occupy at once because God is on our side. This wasn't just some vain exercise in seeing if they could be great. It was to accept God's promise. God had promised wonderful, powerful, mighty things, and all they had to do was trust him. What was this trust based on? remembering what God had done. And so the question really becomes, why do we forget? I think the first one is we are blinded by the moment. And you look at Exodus 16, what was going on? They were hungry. In chapter 17, they were thirsty. In Numbers 14, they were terrified. By the way, I got to tell you, if I haven't eaten in that many days, I'm going to be pretty cranky. If I don't have water, that's going to be concerning. If I see a bunch of giants in the land, that is concerning to me. Okay, imagine that you are the local junior college 
and you're going up against, I'll go ahead and just add both of them just so no one gets mad, Alabama or Auburn, the football team. You look across the field, how are you feeling about your chances of success? Well, if you have brain cells left after playing football so long, you're saying, my odds are not good today. And what we see is what we can't do. What we see is what's holding us down. And so when I look around, what do I see this past year? I see a whole lot of things I can't do that I don't get to do that I wish I could. And all of a sudden we start talking about that with other folks. And we say, I just can't believe that we can't do this. I can't believe the government's doing that. I just can't believe it's like this. I can't believe it's like that. All of a sudden we can't believe anything. It's real difficult to be a content, faithful, trusting Christian when all we see, talk about, and experience are things that are negative. But isn't that an easy trap to fall into? Because it's right before us. To remember God is a preordained decision. That is, we have to decide this morning that no matter what happens, no matter what the government does, no matter what my family does, no matter what my friends do, I am ready to trust God. He will get me through. Probably not in the way I devise, which by the way is to my better. But God will get me through. I have to be able to look up. In Colossians chapter 3, with much more of a spiritual mindset, Paul said, set your mind on things above. Right? We, if we are fixated on those spiritually great things, if we're focused on God, on righteousness and holiness, those first four verses of Colossians chapter 3 really help us in the here and now. It doesn't necessarily help me get the most food on my plate, but it helps me trust in a God who will make sure I have that food. When Jesus says that we aren't to worry, he says, seek first the kingdom of God as righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That means looking past my concerns, over my worries and asking one very simple question. Will this matter in eternity? If it does, let's take care of it. And by the way, sometimes we use that question as a club and it's unfair. Well, sometimes people will say, well, I have my time for God. And then what that means is I'm only Bible reading. I'm only praying. There's so much more to the picture of redeeming the time as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter five. For example, when you think about a household, it has to be what? Provided for. When God says that we're provide for our family members, elderly and younger, that means somebody has to what? Well, somebody has to work. That's in God's service. So does that matter for eternity? Yes. Providing for your family members does matter. It does make a difference. But we can be blinded by the moment and think that that's all there is. And that would be missing it. I think the other thing is we just get distracted by busyness. Look with me in Matthew chapter 13. There's so many examples in the New Testament of missing Jesus, of hearing him, seeing the miracles, and finding some reason to just move past it and not worry about it. But I think the most direct, besides the parable of the man who kept building bigger and bigger barns until what happened? Well, his soul was required of him that very day. He finally had everything, and he said, I'm going to relax, I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to have peace. And God required a soul of him that very night. But in Matthew 13, in explaining the parable of the sower, Notice what's happening with the thorny ground. In Matthew 13, verse 22, Jesus says, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Do you want to key in on both phrases in verse 22? The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. We think about riches, and we understand we can get distracted by that. We might not put God first if we're striving for some sort of material bliss. And that's a problem. But I do think that first one is a whole lot more tempting for a whole lot more folks. In verse 22, the cares of the world. Even if I've got it down that I'm not living for this world and I don't need to accumulate wealth just to sit there in a bank and where someone can come in and steal. I do have to struggle with the cares of the world because there's a whole lot of good things to be doing. There's bad things that we need to avoid, of course. There's a whole lot of neutral things that we can and should be doing. But you know what the problem with that is? Those neutral and good things sometimes get in the way of the best thing, the right thing. We can only have one first priority. If you think about the Israelites, what were, they, what were they forgetting? They were forgetting that God could take care of them. They were forgetting, by the way, when they came into the land, they would start to say exactly what God wanted them to avoid. Look at what we've done. Look at who we are. Later, after Solomon has instituted and the temple has been built, look at this temple. We can't possibly fall as long as the temple is here. The people would go into captivity because they were wrong about that. Israel would go into captivity at the hands of the Assyrians. And Babylon would come and take out the people of Judah. And they'd come back. And they'd start working on rebuilding the temple. And before they finished the temple, guess what they got caught up in doing? Taking care of their own home. 
In Haggai chapter 1 and verse 4, God would ask, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins? We can put God first or we can put ourselves first. There can't be two first priorities. We can get busy. There's a lot of good things. We have to decide today and tomorrow morning and as we plan our week, is this a good thing? Is this a necessary thing? What is most important? and take care of that first. We need to realize that we sometimes forget because taking time to remember has consequences. Turn back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, some verses that we moved over. In Deuteronomy chapter 8. While I don't think the Israelites purposely made sure that they would forget what God had done just to avoid it, I think sometimes we might be uncomfortable with deeper study more prayer time, because what we realize is when we do that, the more we look into the mirror of God's word, the more I realize how many flaws I have. And that's not a good feeling. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. If I do remember, if I take the time to put the first things first, that might require something really deep. It might require sacrifice. It might make me realize that all these things I'm spending all my time doing, I just, I can barely sleep because I have so many good or neutral things going on in my life that I've neglected the one thing that matters. It's interesting to me that when Jesus encounters the rich young ruler, as we studied last Sunday morning in Bible class, he comes to him and there's one phrase that's always stood out to me about that story. And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. And he said, yes. He said, I've kept these from my youth. Jesus doesn't negate that. I think that's pretty amazing. He says, this one thing you lack. And we know that one thing was to go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And the man left sorrowful. But I'm amazed by looking at my life and all the flaws I have. Jesus looked at somebody and said, you lack one thing. Isn't that amazing? There's just one thing standing in the way of this man and pleasing his Lord. I think that's phenomenal. Now, maybe Jesus was hyperbolizing what was happening. Maybe he was just saying there's one major thing. There's a bunch of little minor things we're not going to talk about right now. But he said this one thing you lack. Problem was when he realized what that one thing was, now the decision in his hand was forced, wasn't it? He had to choose. Do I want to keep my wealth? Or do I want to please my Lord? And at the moment, it didn't look like the choice was moving in the right direction. He went away sorrowful. The text says, for he had a great many possessions. I'm afraid sometimes we face that choice. The more we study, the more we look at God's word, the more we realize how far short we fall of the glory of God. And there's some good news here. The good news is that God realizes that already. That's not news to him. That might be news to us. It's not to him. But what does he do with the Israelites who complain and whine in Exodus 16, who complain and whine in chapter 17, who complain and whine over and over and over again? God loves them. Isn't that amazing? God takes care of them. He has patience for them. At one point, God talks about destroying them and starting over in Exodus chapter 32, and that even comes up again. That would be my response all the time. If I was Moses or Aaron, I'd say, all right, we're just starting over. Forget it. This is ridiculous. But God doesn't view us that way. His love is so much greater. And so I do need to sacrifice because my God is there. So my question is how to remember and what do we do with that? Number one, take time to consider what God has already done. We have to look back. Look back not at what was terrible, but at what was good, what was amazing. Notice in Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, we think about Jesus, and of all the miracles he did, here's another one that stands out. In verse 40, and a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And moved with pity, other translations render it compassion. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. That's verse 45. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Now, I want to be very clear on what I'm about to say. When Jesus says don't talk about something, we don't talk about it. I am not endorsing, here's what Jesus said, do the opposite. That's how uh, you you get the name for being a bad preacher. But when Jesus says, don't talk about it, what does this man go to do, verse 45? He speaks freely. Why? Because he hates Jesus? Not at all. He recognized him as having power in verse 40. He approached Jesus essentially and said, if you will, you can make me clean. 
he was so moved by what Jesus did, he couldn't help but tell everybody about it. And while there's certainly an evangelistic pitch there, moving beyond that into my life, when I am worried about what's going on, when I see only bad, I have to look back and say, hey, look at what God has done. Look at how amazing it is that we are at this point in time. And while this is not the way I would do it, and it's not ideal for me, look at all the blessings God has already showered us with. And especially in a nation in a time like this, how blessed are we? In the book of Proverbs, one of the proverb writers says, that God would neither make me poor nor rich. Because if I'm poor, I might be tempted to steal and take what doesn't belong to me. And if I'm rich, there might be an arrogance and haughtiness and a self-sufficiency that avoids me from finding my God. We have so much to be thankful for. And it's so easy to forget what God has done. And even if all of this was stripped away, even if all of our freedoms and everything that we love was taken away, Isn't it amazing what God has done? I'm so excited that we can meet together again, that we can worship together, that we can be in the same room. Do y'all remember when that wasn't a thing? We're still wearing masks. It still looks like some sort of robbery could happen at any time, even among folks in church clothes. But isn't it amazing that we can be here? When we look back at what God has done, we say there were years of worshiping without even thinking about something like that. That's special. But even if all of that was miserable, even if it was all terrible, we, like the leper, had a problem that we have no solution for. But Jesus did. Because Jesus was moved with compassion and submission to the Father's will, he came and died on the cross for our sins that we can live. And so what do I do now? I count every blessing. And I start with that first one that I just can't help but tell everybody who will listen. Jesus died for my sins. He died for your sins. 1 John 2, 2 says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And no matter how problematic that is for certain worldviews, it makes it very clear in the scripture, Jesus wants everyone to follow after him. And so what do we do with that? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's no reason to get down. There's no reason to be tired of everything and to just can't believe everything because there's so much God has already done that we should be thankful for. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in beginning in verse 15, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. And we know verse 17, pray without ceasing. Isn't it interesting in verse 15? Even if evil is done, what do we respond with? good. We rejoice always. And even in verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't matter what happens. If someone's evil, do good anyway. If someone is coming for you, do good anyway. If this world is tough, if things don't make sense, if it is really hard for you, count the blessings you do have. That doesn't mean like the Israelites did in Exodus 16, that we don't have hunger. Counting my blessings does not mean that I don't need water. It doesn't mean that when I look at the giants in the promised land that they aren't bigger than me. We do face those needs. We do face insurmountable odds. But with God, the odds aren't insurmountable at all. And I can look back to what God has done and know that I don't have to guess on that. I need to look to what God has promised for his people. We're going to conclude here. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 15. As we conclude this section of 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the facts of the gospel, that Jesus died. He was buried and he was resurrected. Paul continues to write that without the resurrection, our faith, our hope is in vain. He talks a lot about what kind of body we'd be raised with, but the key is in 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 50, we look back and say, God has done great things. Think about where where your life is now. And we don't always understand why it's here, why it's like it is, but in a few years, you know what we often get? Some perspective. And I can't be the only person who's done something and said a few years later, now I understand. That was for the best. The moment, maybe I did, maybe I didn't agree, but I can look back and see what God has done. I have so many things right now in the present to count my blessings for, but most importantly, we look forward. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, 
who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. No matter what happens, verse 57, we need to be thankful to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. But you notice what verse 58 says without putting the word in there, don't you? Therefore, because of, can I add for our lesson this morning, remembering, remembering that we have victory in Jesus. What do we do? Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we can know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Isn't it awesome that we serve a God who shows us first what it means to trust in a higher power, who shows us first that he is a God who not only is powerful, but that he cares for you and me. The biggest crime of the Israelites with God wasn't just that they were hungry or thirsty or even that they complained. It was that God had done everything for them. And he said, he had said, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And even in hearing those blessings and watching what God had done, they rejected him because of what was right in front of their eyes. He makes the same but even more powerful offer for us that we can be his people. We can be a part of the family of God, so we should never get distracted by what's right in front of us. We should look to God because there's victory in Jesus. If you're here this morning, you've never become a Christian, recognize that victory, that pathway to being in the family of God is also clear. Just as God has shown us that he will forgive sins, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, so our faith isn't in vain. We do see that God has expectations. We need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Confess him as Lord. Repent of our sins saying, hey, I'm no longer going to do what's wrong. I'm going to do whatever God says. When he says it, it goes. I'm going to be baptized into Christ so that I can have the forgiveness of my sins and start knowing my salvation is clear. Because without baptism, without faith, without belief, we're outside of the family. And only within Jesus is there a pathway to God. Or maybe you're a Christian this morning and like the Israelites, we've seen what God has done. We know what he offers, but it's too easy to get distracted. Recognize you have a church family that loves you. They'll pray with you and pray for you. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.